season one of Amazon's Wheel of Time series. Now, I've reviewed each of the episodes, but I wanted to take some time before I reviewed the first season as a whole. In a series like this, there is a lot that we didn't find out until the end, so reviewing each individual episode feels a bit like rating individual chapters in a book. There's a lot to judge, but we really can't fully say whether it worked or not until the end of the season. So I took a week, rewatched all the episodes in order, and now it's time to give the first season a final grade. Did season one of the Wheel of Time adaptation get off to a good start, or was this season a dud? Join me today as I break down what I loved from the first season, what I didn't love, and I'll give an overall score to Amazon's first season of the Wheel of Time adaptation. So before we get into the video, let me mention not a sponsor for the video, but a charity that I'm trying to support. My podcast, Tarval and After Dark, we did a New Year's Eve special which you can actually find on this channel. It's like five hours long. We were attempting to raise money for The Trevor Project, which is a charity dedicated to helping young LGBTQ plus people with mental health, suicide prevention, counseling, and other services. It's an awesome charity. That group has one of the highest suicide rates in the country, and The Trevor Project is honestly one of the best charities that I know, not only in what their mission is, but also their effectiveness in carrying it out. And although New Year's Eve has come and gone, I am leaving that fundraising page up to see if we can raise even more money for the cause. We set out to raise $3,000, and in just five hours, we ended up raising more than 5,000. I love this community because they show up, and I would love to keep showing up. I wanna see if we can get ourselves to six or seven or $8,000. I have a link in the description of this video. Please give if you are able to give. It's a great charity to support. Thank you for everybody who did. Thank you for all of you who will. So let's get on to the spoiler warning for the video. Today's video is gonna carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through the first season of Wheel of Time. This video will be book spoiler free, however, other than some concepts. So there shouldn't be any major book spoilers other than what is in the show. So in talking about season one, it really does help now to have a full perspective on what they were trying to accomplish with the first season of the show. I think there are multiple ways to judge if they succeeded or not, but those truly depend on what you view the goal to be. If you wanted a one-for-one -one adaptation of the book story, or pretty close to it, and that is the lens through which you were judging the success or the failure of the first season, then I would assume you viewed the season to be an utter and complete failure, as it was far from a one-to-one -one adaptation. If you wanted a show that gave an introduction to the gigantic world of the Wheel of Time and was geared towards non-book readers and was trying to engage with a large audience of people who have never read or never heard of the books before now, you might judge that differently than you would from a one-to-one -one adaptation. Additionally, if you were looking for an adaptation that wasn't necessarily true to the plot of the books, but it nailed the characters and overall feel of the series, then you might judge it differently still. I think a lot of the ways that people viewed this series and whether it succeeded or if it failed was based on how they came into wanting to watch it. We're gonna to examine today how did the show do in those various categories, but I first wanna start with overall what I loved and what I didn't. So let's start as I did in my other reviews with what I loved from the show. And I think the thing that stood out the most to me was both the casting and the performances of the actors. There were very few performances that I didn't like this season, and some of them were absolutely incredible. When they set out to cast this show, they went into it with the mindset that they would go after very strong actors rather than simply people who looked like the book characters. And I think that paid off fairly well for them. Kate Fleetwood was absolutely fantastic as Leandrin. She brought a nuance and level of drama to the character that I thought exceeded that of the books. Rosamund was obviously great, she felt like Moraine to me from the first time I saw her. That's me. I thought Zoe Robbins as Nynaeve was outstanding, as well as Madeline Madden as Egwene. Of the three boys, I thought they all gave good performances for what they were given to act on, but I thought Barney Harris as Matt truly shined. It's such a shame that he isn't going to be around anymore and that he had to leave the project. We'll talk more about that in a moment, though. There was really not a bad performance in the main roles of the show, though. And I think this was a testament to the job that Kate Valentine Hendry did with casting these characters and the performances that were given. Some characters had more to work with, but they all, for the most part, did a great job with what they had. 
Another conceptual thing that I loved was the fact that the Wheel of Time felt very much like its own thing. At no point did I feel like this was a Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings knockoff, and I was very much worried that it could be seen that way. The Wheel of Time felt like something very distinctive and very unique. From the score from Lauren Balfe to the set design to the locations they filmed at, it really did feel like its own thing, and I appreciated that. In terms of some specific things that I loved, I thought the vast majority of the cold opens were done very well. The two that I think stood far and away above the rest to me were the episode 4 cold open with Loghain's attack on Gildon, and then the episode 7 cold open of the Blood Snow and Rand's mommy killing everybody while giving birth, a true badass. Now I loved the opening of Gildon, first because it introduced another nation and city, but we also got to see Loghain at his full power, and I loved the interactions that he had with the King of Gildon in the scene. I thought it was a great setup for the rest of the episode, and his plotline in general I thought was great, so that was a good addition. The Blood Snow cold open was amazing choreography, and what was amazing about the scene was the performance of the stunt actors who played the Aiel, Magda Satova, and the fact that no lines were spoken here. But the scene was captivating from beginning to end, culminating with the Heronmark sword at the end of the episode, which was teasing that Tam was going to take the baby. Now, I know I already talked about performances, but I also loved Johan Myers as Hot on Fane and what they did with Fane's characters, aside from the clunky end. He was menacing. He had a very evil casualness to him. Again, it's hard to describe, but it was awesome. And his smile is killer. I thought he nailed that part. I also loved the portrayal of the White Cloaks, specifically Eamon Volda. Eamon Volda was the perfect level of creepy, powerful, fanatical, and dangerous. Uh, he stole the scenes that he was in, and specifically the cold open of episode two. It really set the tone for how awful some of the more fanatical arms of the White Cloaks can actually be. I also loved something that I did not think I would love in the adaptation. I thought, and that was the actual eye of the world itself. That's not to say I loved the last episode, or even their way making it to the eye, but I thought the confrontation at the eye of the world was unique, and it made sense, and it gave a reason for the eye of the world to actually exist. I specifically liked the way that it was an actual trap, and that Rand may have inadvertently actually cracked the Dark One's prison open, and that that was a ruse from Ashamael from the very beginning to get him there, and cause that to happen. I thought that specific plot line was the only part that worked in episode 8 really well, and it was done very, very well for the most part. But let's now talk about what I did not like from the season. There were certainly quite a few individual things that I did not like from each episode. Things like the complete lack of fighting from Lan in the final episode, something that he's supposed to be awesome at, or Perrin's complete lack of an arc and poor choices with his backstory, or even the stuff associated with Barney Harris's exit from the show. But rather than going through the list of changes, choices, and bad stuff from the episodes that I didn't make think made sense, I can actually split my main issues with the season into three categories of issues which I thought hurt the season. First is the obvious need for more episodes. We found out that Rafe had originally asked for 10 episodes in a two-hour pilot, but was approved only for the eight that we got and a one-hour pilot. The need for more episodes is extremely obvious, as the character development suffered, details were left out, the world building was smaller, and parts of the plot were cut that would have been just cool to see. Obviously, with more episodes would have come a slightly higher budget also, which we would hope they would give. Now, let me give a few examples here. I already mentioned Perrin's lack of an arc. There was just simply not enough time with our main characters, both together and apart, to truly establish character arcs and personalities. The best parts of shows like Game of Thrones were not the dragons or the CGI or the warfare or even the politics. It was the conversations between the characters, the development early on. A good example is the chaos is a ladder speech between Varys and Littlefinger. It was excellent writing, excellent performances, and there was no action at all. It was two guys standing there talking. We need time to let the main characters breathe, and we need to give more time to some of the more neglected ones of the much. Additionally, there was backstory that we just didn't get that we should have, that or explanations of things that we didn't get. For example, the messy pacing in episode one would have been mostly solved 
by simply tacking on another 5 to 10 minutes to the episode to explain why those specific kids needed to leave, or getting encouragement from their family members to leave, or at least fully understanding why they needed to go. Possibly Tam forcing Rand to take the sword for more setup down the road in the season. All of that would have led to the ending of that episode feeling less abrupt and more earned. As it was, it just felt like Maureen said go and then they left. And that just didn't feel real. The same could have been said throughout the other episodes. More character time and more development with good conversations would have done nothing but add to the backstory, to the world building, to the rules of the magic system. It would have familiarized watchers with the world of the Wheel of Time. The argument you can make against all that is that talking can be boring, but I would argue that very good character writing and very good dialogue will never be boring, and it makes the big event payoffs all the more powerful and all the more earned. It is somewhat ludicrous to expect that the one of the longest fantasy series of all time, with some of the most elaborate world building and history in that world, gets a mere eight episodes to adapt its first novel, when smaller books have gotten longer seasons from other networks. Amazon, you have the money, and I understand that these are very expensive to produce. They really are. My only hope here is, is that they see the need to put more money into this and blow up the budget and the number of episodes. The other thing that more episodes would have done is help solve my second major issue with the season, so this is a great lead in here. I think they made some poor choices on where they did spend their time. Once they were given eight episodes to make this show happen, it would have been better, in my opinion, to focus on the main characters. It's much easier to make this judgment in hindsight, however. For example, the step-in scenes in episode five were very well done. I like that they address depression, setting up the water bond and what happens when it's broken. But this never really paid off for later in the season. This wasn't much of a setup to anything and more just an addition to the plot. If you have eight episodes and you are lacking development of some of your main characters, why spend most of an entire episode of that season following the plot of a character who doesn't exist in the books, who doesn't have relevance to the season, and who doesn't even set up a plot point for later in the season's finale? Those are some of the choices that I just questioned. If they had more episodes, stuff like this becomes possible and even welcome. I would have loved the step in plot line if we had more, more episodes to fit it in. But given that they didn't, that choice seems baffling to me. The same goes for the character of Loyal. We barely got to see him, so his relevance to the ways wasn't explained. The ways themselves weren't explained. What Ogier R wasn't addressed. There was more time needed in the ways. We would have done very well to get another five minutes in the ways of Loyal explaining what and how they were made. Then we could have had another five minutes of them intensely being chased through the ways and more Trollocs there, more fighting, rather than sprinting for 30 feet and leaving. It just felt too abrupt. Again. They were forced into choices because of the lack of episodes and the lack of time, but some of the choices they did make just didn't make a ton of sense. But by far my most important criticism, and the one that I am most concerned about going forward here, is my last one. The first two I've mentioned I think are going to improve with a larger budget. Perhaps more episodes in season three, without having to write around an actor leaving mid-shoot, two shutdowns for the pandemic. All that isn't going to happen in the future, hopefully. But what is my most important criticism here? Well, it's nuanced to explain, but it's something that we watched happen in the later seasons of the Game of Thrones. They started writing to plot points and spectacle that they just wanted us to see, rather than staying true to the established rules of their world and creating a believable story within it. But you say, Nablus, Game of Thrones was a show about magic and dragons and 700-foot ice walls. You can't complain about realism in a show with dragons. And I would say, yes, I can. Fantasy works because it establishes a fantastical world for us to escape into, but typically there are rules about how those worlds operate. In Game of Thrones, I believed dragons because they looked real, and I understood what they were capable of, what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were. An extreme example of what I'm talking about here would be if in one of the Game of Thrones episodes, all of a sudden in season eight, a dragon started talking and it could shoot candy out of its eyeballs. That would be against the rules for dragons that we knew up to that point. And you would be just as annoyed and distracted as I would be by that. That's a very crude and stupid way 
uh, of explaining this, but writing to a plot occurrence that you want or to a spectacle is bad news. They wanted Daenerys and her dragons to go beyond the wall and save Jon Snow, so they had her teleport 3,000 miles in an hour on a dragon. It made no sense. They want the Dothraki back for the final episode, so they're just going to ignore the fact that they killed him off in an earlier episode. That's the type of stuff that brought Game of Thrones down. So now to the wheel of time. They haven't gone that far off the deep end with this yet, but there are some signs that have me somewhat worried. I first thought this at a scene that most people, including myself at the time, sort of liked, and I still kind of like it. That was Nynaeve's explosion of healing in episode four. It was a cool moment. It looked awesome, and Nynaeve is my favorite character, so when she does something badass, I like it. That being said, it was kind of unearned to a degree, and it was something lore-wise that mass healing just isn't possible that we knew of. But more importantly, it scaled her power very quickly. Let's then jump forward to the women standing out defending the gap with the one power in the final episode. Now all of a sudden, five untrained women can obliterate an army of 10 to 20,000 Trollocs in a few minutes. Yes, some of them burnt out, but that doesn't mean that that should have been possible. The power scaling is going to be really, really hard to keep up with at this point. We've sort of trivialized the bad guys. Trollocs are no longer a big deal because a couple girls can wipe them all out. Egwene healing what appeared to be death, even though it wasn't actually death. And how many times are they going to play that card? That just gave the impression, by the way, that Egwene's tears are like Phoenix tears from Harry Potter and she can bring people back by crying on them. Again, it's kind of ridiculous, but like they're overplaying the fake death thing here. The wave at the end of the season with the Sean Chan, that looked cool looked badass, but it was totally out of character for the Shan Chan, and it accomplished nothing for them. It was done for the spectacle for us. That only seems genuine to a point until you can't wow people with it one more time. You can't wow people with another big spectacle if it doesn't keep making sense. Things can't just happen because we think they would be cool. They need to make sense in the world, follow the lore that you establish, be plausible to the watchers. I don't care if the lore is different from the books as long as it's established and then you follow it. But I'm worried they've written themselves into the corner with some of the spectacle moments they've given us in season one. That's my biggest worry, and I really hope that trend does not continue into season two. I truly also think that my disappointments with season one have a lot to do with the final episode. I mentioned this in my episode seven review. I thought they had a chance to go out on a very high note. Episode seven was well received for the most part, and it had some very solid moments in it. Episode eight just deflated a lot of people, and it compounded some of the issues from the earlier in the season. And yes, it's worth mentioning they had to deal with a lot here. People are actually downplaying the effect of it, actually, but COVID wrecked havoc on this production from start to finish, and it forced them to adapt to a lot on the fly. They had two full COVID shutdowns, which meant that they couldn't go back to previous film sites for reshoots. This meant unfinished scenes. This meant trying to insert people in with green screens. That actually happened. It meant fewer extras for the final battle. It meant having to rewrite entire interactions, the entire plot of the last two episodes. It meant weaker CGI. It meant one of the actors wasn't there and they had to write him out of the story. All of these things hurt the later half of the season. So I do have hope for the future as hopefully they're not going to have to deal with this in future seasons. If you average out my scores for the individual episodes, you're going to get a rough 7.5 out of 10 for my score for the season. But I think taken in totality and the general feel of the season, I have to give season one a 6.5 out of 10. And yes, that's a lower number. But I think having the full picture of the season gives more context to some of the decisions they made along the way. So 6.5 is my score for the season. I thought it was a decent start. It was very strong at times. It was very weak at others. And a whole lot of chaos was involved in the production. I think it was a strong enough showing that I will enjoy rewatches. I'm very excited for season two. I think there's a lot that they could have done differently, but I'm hoping some of it doesn't carry on to the future. And I think they're going to learn from some of their mistakes. But keep in mind with my rating here that I came into this season not expecting a one for one adaptation or expecting them to totally placate to non book readers. I wanted Wheel of Time with plot changes, but with characters feeling true to who they are. For the most part, that was true. But there were things that worried me, as I've mentioned. But I think I'm harsher than a non-book reader would be, but not as harsh as someone who wanted a more accurate page-for-page -page adaptation. One bright spot here is the fact that the vast majority of non-book readers I've spoken with, including my own family and people at work, 
all loved the season. I came in uh, to see my parents and siblings arguing over who the Dragon Reborn would be one day. I had people at work ask me if the books were worth reading because they loved the show. I haven't heard any non-book readers, in my personal life at least, say anything negative about the show. So regardless of my personal views on it, that's a success. That gives me a lot of hope if that many non-book readers loved it. I've seen a huge uptick on my channel in watching my old lore videos. They're my highest viewed videos in the last two months. Those are all new readers. Again, those things give me a lot of hope. So what were your overall thoughts on the first season of the Wheel of Time? Let me know in the comments of the video. Did the delay since the ending now, now that you've had a week or two, does that give you more time to think about it? Do you like it more now than you did then, or do you like it less? Let me know that as well. Make sure to also like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll have more Wheel of Time content on the way. I'll be getting back to doing weekly Wheel of Time news videos, as well as some more lore content and some major updates on the way for thegreatblight.com. I've been working on some maps again as well. Here is a very unfinished map of Camelin. Uh, I've been working on that, and I will release it in the near future. Thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. I could not do this without you. If you want to support what I do here, make sure to check out Patreon. That is the best way to do it. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, peace out.